Good morning. Welcome to worship with the First Parish in Lincoln. We are a community that was originally gathered in 1749, but took our current form in 1942 when the Unitarian and the Congregational churches in town joined forces with each other. So we're a group with a wide theological spectrum, and we welcome you with open hearts this morning. Usually we worship uh, in a beautiful sanctuary in the center of Lincoln, but right now we worship right here online every Sunday at 10 a.m. And we know you've got a lot of different choices and options for Sunday, so if you're here, we're very glad that you're here with us. We have a few announcements this morning. The first is just I want to encourage you to put your prayers in the little chat box at the bottom of the screen, um, and we'll read those during the prayer time later in the service. Um, rem remember to stay muted so we don't hear the sound in your household. And I hope some of you can join me and Andy Fallender this Thursday at 1.30 for another meditative walk. We walk for about an hour, 50 feet apart in silence. And this week we are meeting um, at the end of Granville Road, Andy tells me. So... These are wonderful walks and uh, we hope you'll join us. And also the morning coffee with me, the minister is back every Thursday at 10 a.m. Uh, so join, join me then. Uh, you'll find details about these things and everything we do here uh, on our website. And our first announcement is Melinda. Good morning, good morning. Um, the deacons and I, welcome you to join us in planning this year's winter solstice celebration we're starting up a committee to explore ideas that are reflective of our time something that expresses our spirituality our hope and faith as we transform from one season to the next so if you're interested in joining us please contact me at Melinda Bruno at hotmail.com. Thanks. Paula? Hi, this is Paula for the Deacons. Next Sunday, October 25th, there will be an outdoor worship service at the Pierce House tent. The sign-up link will be available on Monday on our website. We can accommodate 60 people in chairs under the tent, 
So please join us there or stay at home and join us on Zoom. That's next Sunday, October 25th at 10 a.m. at the Pierce House Tent. Thank you, Paula. And registration is required for that uh, outdoor worship, so sign up online. Larry Buell, what do you have for us? Thank you, Jenny. Uh, this is an announcement on behalf of Outreach, which is just about to start its annual Gene Wood Preston Grant competition. And we're asking for all your help and input at this point. Um, for the last uh, six years, uh, we've been able to award a dozen or more grants uh, to local area charities for either capital improvement or a transformative innovation, new programs that take the organization to a higher level. Uh, often, uh, these have been suggested by our members and we're asking now if you would uh, think and let us know of uh, any smallish, well-organized uh, organizations, charitable, within a radius of about 35 miles of here that you think we should consider. Uh, contact us uh, whether or not uh, you believe we already know. Uh, I'll put the uh, contact information in uh, the chat box uh, after I finish talking. Uh, and uh, just to bear in mind, we've given grants uh, in the areas of food security, medical services, racial equity, uh, immigrant assistance, homeless alle homelessness alleviation, environmentalism, all of these and more uh, in the five to $25,000 range. Um, we want to send the invitations to apply soon and uh, thank you very much for um, any suggestions you might provide. Thank you, Jenny. Thanks so much. So now let us deepen into worship with the opening words. You will probably recall that when we are together in person, we stand for these opening words and we say them responsibly. So today I'm going to say them responsibly and Barbara O'Neill is going to read the people part. But if at home you want to read those words yourself, please do so. <laughs> We come to this time and place to rediscover the gift of a free religious community. To renew our faith in the holiness, goodness, and beauty of life. To reaffirm the way of the open mind and the full heart. To rekindle the flame of memory and hope. And to renew the vision of an earth made fair with all her people one. And now let us sing in our own homes, if we choose. I always love singing these hymns. Our opening hymn, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Thank you. 
I invite you to say the covenant with me. In the love of truth and in the spirit of Jesus, we unite for the worship of God and in the service of all. Thank you so much, Ellery. That was great. This month, we've been thinking about deep listening. Deep listening for God and nature, listening for and responding to the voices of oppressed people, and today, listening for God's heart. Let's see what's in the Wonder Box this morning. Wonder Box is over here. It's an ear. It's an ear. Which, what? Margaret, that's not an ear. What do you mean it's not an ear? Atticus, what are you telling me? Oh my gosh, it's not an ear. My script says it's in here, and it, it fits on my head, actually. It must be in here, but it's not. It's a heart. But what does the heart have to do with deep listening? When you listen with your heart, you can find out how people feel. Part of deep listening is listening with our hearts. To hear another person truly and fully. It is one way to show compassion. I think it means really paying attention when the person is trying to tell you something. Oh, sorry. What? What did you say? I wasn't paying attention. That's what I was just talking about. What? Listening with your heart means really paying attention when a person is saying something. Uh-huh. Listening what? with your heart means really paying attention when a person is trying to tell you something. Uh huh. Um, Margaret. What? Listening with your heart means really paying attention when somebody's trying to tell you something. Uh huh. I I give up. Oh wait. So you mean that listening with your heart means really paying attention when a person is trying to tell you something? Yes. Why didn't you say so? Our busy lives and distractions of a busy and anxious world are a bit like a distracted director of religious education. We are kept from listening for and hearing the voice, the heart of God. Praying is a way to slow down and open ourselves to the divine, having a real heart to heart. May it be so. Our first reading is written by Frederick, Reverend Frederick Beekner. We all pray, whether we think of it as praying or not. The odd silence we fall into when something very beautiful is happening, or something very good or very bad. The ah that sometimes floats up out of us as out of a 4th of July crowd when the skyrocket bursts over the water. The stammer of pain at somebody else's pain. The stammer of joy at somebody else's joy. Whatever words or sounds we use for sighing with over our own lives. These are all prayers in their way. They're all spoken not just to ourselves, but to something even more familiar than ourselves and even more strange than the world. We come to the time now that we set aside for silent and spoken prayers. Please join in singing the prayer hymn, which will be followed by a few moments of silence our community prayers, and the pastoral prayer.
please join me as we lift up these prayers from the people. Barbara O'Neill asks us to remember Joe Halstein, a prayer of thankfulness for the beauties and wonders of nature. Gratitude for the life of Larry and Kim's son-in-law, David, who passed just recently peacefully and surrounded in love. And a prayer for those who struggle with illnesses of all sorts. It's not just COVID and cares of all sorts. May we all find peace. God of all people, God of each person, may we hold these prayers spoken and those prayers unspoken in your love. Amen. To the spirit that is in us and all around us, we pray. We have been eight months in a pandemic. We are an industrious people. We wear masks, we wash our hands, we keep our distance, but how much longer? We are tired. Everything is harder now. We have planted gardens, cleaned our closets, taught our children, taken food to the hungry. We've learned to communicate on Zoom. And we are voting with hope in our hearts. And we are tired. We feel the coming of colder days. And sometimes sadness creeps in. We have all lost people whom we love whether it was last week, last year, or 30 years ago. How will we go on, we wonder, and yet we do. We know there are no words that can touch grief. We carry it deep inside. And yet the sun warms our shoulders on these fall days, circling us with what feels like love. The moon works its way through her cycles, giving us two full moons in October, as if she knows we need some extra company during our sleepless nights. Nature does its best to cheer us up. Maple leaves surprise us with their beauty every year. We plant garlic and bulbs, planning for spring already. And we have each other. We are careful to keep our distance but a short conversation on a sunny afternoon can clear away the clouds of loneliness. May we find ways to care for each other in the months ahead. May we remember to reach out with a wave, a phone call, a letter, and conversations across the six foot divide. May we feel touched without touching. And may we remember to find rest and know that grief and joy sit side by side as they always have and always will. Amen. We appreciate your generosity so very much in this time please donate online at fplincoln.org slash donate.
Our reading today is from Philippians 4, and I'm first going to read to you from the Revised Standard Version and then from a translation called The Message. Philippians 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And the same verses, but a different translation. Celebrate God all day, every day. I mean, revel in God. Make it as clear as you can to all you meet that you're on their side, working with them and not against them. Don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers, letting God know your concerns. Before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good, will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. So I want to speak about prayer today, and if that seems kind of abstract, kind of a stretch, kind of irrelevant in the world in which we're living, I get it, I really do. I see what you see, COVID surging in Europe, here and around the world, 400,000 cases yesterday. I see a national conversation over racism with a rawness and an urgency that knows no bounds. I see a presidential election, a Supreme Court nomination. All of it makes our breath quicken, grow shallow when we think of what's at stake. In our national leadership, I see a dearth of moral courage so stark, it makes our hearts cry out and grow cold within us. We see death dealing forces on the rise. White supremacy, fear of the other, hatred pitting one group against another, truth desecrated and justice forgotten. You can make the list yourself. Yesterday, the moratorium on evictions in Massachusetts ran out. Do we get what that means in real time for the people of our Commonwealth? National me mental health statistics are through the roof. Depression, anxiety up 40% and even more in teens and young adults. Do you have someone in your life you're watching with a close eye? I know that I do. And let me add parenthetically that this is all added to our personal lives where there was already plenty going on, good things and hard things, and none of that has gone away. Yes, these are times that try our souls, and that's why I wanna talk about prayer today. Now more than ever, we need to return to some of the great central truths of the world's religions. I'm thinking today of two great threads, two paths, if you will, that you can find in so many of the world's religions, the active and the contemplative. The path of action, working for justice, helping the poor, healing the sick, trying to right the wrongs, doing. And the path of contemplation, when the soul turns inward and tries to restore itself through silence, meditation, prayer, whatever spiritual practice you found that is life-giving for you, that helps you recharge to go out and fight the battles all over again. 
E.B. White once said, I rise in the morning torn between the desire of whether to savor the world or to save it. That makes it hard to plan the day. So today, the contemplative, and next week, October 25th, when we gather under the tent, some of us and others on Zoom, and give our kids their Bibles at long last, the active path, the prayer of doing, of action in the world. Prayer can be a problem. It's one of those words that's used by so many different people to mean so many different things that it almost becomes meaningless. Over my years as a minister, I've encountered many people who have struggled mightily with prayer. There are all sorts of reasons, and they're good reasons. And I'll tell you, I've struggled mightily myself. You say the word prayer and instantly roadblocks come up. I'm gonna talk about only two of them this morning. The first is who? Who am I praying to, if anyone? And the second is what for? Why? What's the point? The purpose and efficacy of prayer. The first, I wonder if one of the biggest roadblocks to prayer is the idea that if you're gonna pray, you have to figure out to whom you're praying. And that can be dicey. Does it mean you have to believe in God? What if you don't or you're not sure? What if you're a humanist? Can you still pray? I remember the Reverend Forrest Church, who was senior minister at All Souls Church Unitarian Universalist in Manhattan on the Upper East Side for many years. He used to say that when someone came up to him and told him that they, didn't, they didn't believe in God, he'd say, tell me about the God you don't believe in. Chances are I don't believe in that God either. I feel the same way about prayer. Tell me about the prayer that you don't go for. And chances are, I won't go for it either. And the second roadblock, are we supposed to pray for something? And if the something doesn't come to pass, does it really matter? What's the point? What validity does prayer have? Is it like a giant slot machine? You put your quarter in, out comes your little bag of Doritos. We may know with our heads up here that prayer doesn't work that way, but somehow long ago that notion snuck in, didn't it? Was instilled in us early on, so early on it's hard for us to shake. Well, people have all different ideas about this, of course, but I'll tell you that Ralph Waldo Emerson hated the kind of prayer that asked for something. Prayer that craves a particular commodity, he wrote, is vicious. Instead, he said, imagine prayer as if we were trying to place ourselves in the middle of something, like getting into the middle of a river, placing ourselves in the middle of the holy, the wise silence, the oversoul, call it what you will. Emerson wrote, Place yourself in the middle of the stream of power and wisdom, which flows into you as life. Place yourself in the full center of that flood. He wrote, that's where you'll find wisdom and guidance. By lowly listening, he said, we shall hear the right word. I've only mentioned two roadblocks and I bet there's a whole lot more of them. There are so many myths and misconceptions that may box us right out of prayer. I think we've made it much smaller and more confining than it could be. And sometimes I wish we could open it up, make it bigger and wider, a space that we can all inhabit, like a great wide field under a great wide open sky. What if we let prayer out to play? Or what if we let ourselves out to play, dance, move, sing with prayer in that great wide open field? 
If this were a lecture on prayer, here's the part where, where I talk to you about different categories, adoration, praise, thanksgiving, confession, petition, and on it goes. But you'll be relieved probably to know that instead I'm going to tell you what writer Anne Lamott has to say about it. She says when it comes to prayer, it all boils down to three things, three prayers. That's all we need, she says. Help, thanks, wow. The first prayer is the hardest, that's help. Because that's the one where we admit that we can't think our way through it or plot or plan our way through it. Can't organize, meddle, control, take charge. That all the machinations of our minds and all the frantic scramblings of our worried hearts can't make it right. Lamont writes, well, I've heard people say that God is the gift of desperation. And there's a lot to be said for having really reached a bottom where you've run out of any more good ideas or plans for everybody else's behavior, how to save and fix and rescue, and just get out of a huge mess, possibly of your own creation. And when you're done, you may take a long quavering breath and say, help. People say help without actually believing that anyone hears that. But it is the great prayer and it's the hardest prayer of all because you have to admit defeat, you have to surrender. And that's the hardest thing that any of us can ever do. She goes on to say that she thinks that when we actually admit defeat and surrender, we're somehow kind of connecting ourselves up to something bigger than ourselves, some kind of power or goodness that she names as God. You know, she says, we're often ashamed of asking for so much help because it seems selfish or petty or narcissistic. But I think, and this is Anne Lamott talking, I think if there's a God, and I believe there is, that God is there to help. That's what God's job is. There's no getting around it. In all my years in ministry, in my own life, prayer can be tricky. But when I close my eyes, I start to see pictures in my head of the people that I have known. A woman I'll call Cornelia, who lived in a high-powered suburb and was married to a high-powered surgeon, they had a full life and raised four kids together and later on he became ill and she became his primary caregiver. The days were so long, she told me, sometimes she thought they'd just wear her right out. And so she taped a little prayer to the windowsill above her sink, a little old Unitarian prayer from her childhood. And she'd look at it, she told me, as she was washing the dishes and sometimes, you know, she'd almost just lean right on the counter of that sink as if she could soak up the strength from those little words, trying to get another scrap of strength for all the long hours that were still left in that day. Or the mother who told me she prayed when she drove her kids around town to soccer and school and doctor and dentist Sometimes she said she sang the words of that hymn, guide my feet while I run this race. Guide my feet, she prayed, this busy young woman who, who sometimes wonders if she's running the race or if it's running her. I think of monks I saw once in a monastery high in the Himalayas with their yak butter tea that smelled so terrible to me but seemed like a big treat for them and their chanting and their prayer flags. I think of a man I know who likes to go out into a hemlock grove when there's a big snowstorm to pray. I think of one of you who told me about growing up as a child in this church and how you had to memorize Psalm 23. And I was bold enough to ask you right there on the spot to recite it and gosh darn it you could all these years later 
I know of someone who says the closest he ever gets to prayer is when he's on his road on his bike and the wind is in his face and the worry and the pressure and the world and the job, they all drop away. And I think of another one of you who said that when things seem so unclear and you just don't know where to turn anymore, these words come back to you from somewhere, not as I will, but thy will be done. You have told me you find prayer on the yoga mat and in the garden, and on the forest path, and in music. Yes, prayer can be a thorny thicket for some of us. It sure has been for me. Given what I do for my vocation, maybe you think I've got it all figured out, but you'd be way wrong on that. But it's true, I'm drawn to prayer. What it is, what it might be, what maybe it isn't, what it could be. I collect little prayers, little scraps of words. And I've tried to cultivate a prayer life of sorts as ragtag as it often seems to me, a smidge of this, a little bit of that. I wonder if some of it began when I was a confused 20 something working in a Quaker camp we started every morning with what we called morning meeting, 10 or 15 minutes of silence, sitting there together in the quiet green of the Vermont Hills. I think that planted something in me, something that lingers all these years later, a foundation maybe, or maybe a craving, a hunger, simply to begin the day with quiet. I remember doing that in divinity school, lighting a candle, writing earnestly in my journal, and in the early years of ministry. And then when I had kids, the whole things went up in flames and I didn't have a minute to myself, but over time, it's come back. And I count on it now, that early morning time, when it's just light, or just before the light comes. In stretches of my life when things are peaceful, it's simply a quiet, joyful time. But in stretches of my life when things are difficult, it's another kind of time, not always easy, but as essential as breathing. I always remember what John Kabat-Zinn, the great meditation teacher said about wave, weave, weaving our parachute before we need it before the crisis comes. Well, most of us don't do that, do we? But when life brings us to our knees, maybe we start to build a little practice of meditation or prayer. Thomas Kelly was a 20th century Quaker mystic. He wrote, deep within us all, there is an amazing inner sanctuary of the soul a holy place, a divine center, a speaking voice to which we may continuously return. Eternity is at our hearts, pressing upon our time-torn lives, warming us with intimations of an astounding destiny, calling us home unto itself. I guess that's what I'm hoping for there in the early morning life, that I can somehow get a little closer to that divine light, to that glimpse of eternity. All these years later, and prayer is still so much a mystery to me, tricky, frustrating, elusive, but if I had to tell you now what I think, I'd say that I think prayer is a language we can all learn how to speak, that it isn't a matter of God or no God, of asking or not asking. Prayer is a language of the heart, of our hearts. And if we're human, we have a heart. And if we're human, we're carrying something in our hearts this day, aren't we? 
Barbara spoke of some of those things in her prayer, as did Margaret. Maybe it's love for another person we're carrying. Maybe it's longing for an outcome we know we can't control but long for anyway. Maybe it's worry, love, or longing for our great wide world that sometimes seems to be breaking apart at the seams. Any or all or none of these things. But when you get right down to it and you're really honest with yourself and with God, if that's a word you use about what is in your heart today, I think that's your prayer. Whatever we carry, whatever we hold. I think I'm gonna keep stumbling around in prayer, feeling inadequate, losing my way, forgetting to do it at all, drifting along half awake. And I imagine it will always be life that brings me to my knees again, brings me up short, makes me pay attention. I always remember the words of a wise colleague and friend, pray as you can, she said to me once, not as you can't. And if in the end, we still don't really know what to make of prayer, don't feel we know what it is or how to do it or how to wrap our arms around it, maybe that's okay. Because as it says in the book of Romans, likewise, the spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. In other words, it is taken out of our hands and prayer is not something anymore to learn or practice or try out. It simply happens in us and through us the spirit praying in us, by us, on the days when we cannot form words at all, but can only sigh or scream or cry. Perhaps that sigh, those tears, perhaps even that is prayer enough for the day. Amen. And let us sing together, alone, together, our final hymn, Life is the Greatest Gift of All. Please join me if you wish in saying our closing words. We go forth from the worship of God to be faithful to the vision of Jesus, to affirm each person's dignity and to cherish the living earth. I remember a service with 
Tim, our deacon, Tim, who's no longer with us. And he read this poem that day. It was a beautiful October day, just like today, a couple of years ago. It's by Edna St. Vincent Millay. These are our closing words. The world stands out on either side, no wider than the heart is wide. Above the world is stretched the sky, no higher than the soul is high. The heart can push the sea and land farther away on either hand. The soul can split the sky in two and let the face of God shine through. Mm. May God's face shine upon you and all those who you love. Amen. Mm.